please welcome Tina Brown. It's great to be here, especially with Tina Brown. And I picked out a section to have her read the book. Um, it's actually the very beginning of her book, and it will get all of our attention. <laughs> oh, God. But I do have to put on my glasses. Okay. Saturday, April the 10th, 1983. I am here in New York City at last, brimming with fear and insecurity. Getting in late last night on British Airways, I suddenly felt the enormousness of New York City, the noise of it, the speed of it, the lonely obliviousness of so many people trying to get ahead. My London bravado began to evaporate. I wished I was with Harry, my husband, who I knew would be sitting at his computer in front of his study window in Kent, furiously pounding away about Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> I am staying at the Rolton Hotel on West 44th Street, opposite the Algonquin Hotel. It's a bit of a flea pit, but in walking distance to the Conde Nast headquarters at 350 Madison Avenue. The man at the desk seemed half asleep when I checked in, and there was no one around to haul my bag to the elevator. All the way in from JFK in the taxi, a phone-in show was blaring a woman with a rasping German accent talking in excruciating detail about blowjobs. <laughs> the instructions crackling from the radio to take it in the mouth and move it slowly up and down got so oppressive, I asked the cab driver what the hell he was listening to. He said it was a sex therapist called Dr. Ruth, who, app <laughs> who apparently gives advice on the radio and has an enormous following. As soon as I wake up, I rush to the newsstand on the corner to look for the April issue of Vanity Fair. The second edition is even more baffling than the first one I saw in London in February. So begins my Vanity Fair diaries. <laughs> Well, all I can say is welcome to America. <laughs> this was the 1980s. So yes. you have Dr. Ruth and you have the Reagans. Oh, I do. We do. And uh, here am I, a young British woman, scarcely out of her 30s, arriving baffled and, and uh, wide-eyed, as you see in the book. And I've been given the assignment of editing Vanity Fair, which is a magazine that had been launched, it was a big failure when it launched after a lot of hype had had two failed uh, editors before me. And then I come in and I'm told, okay, sink or swim, you know, we're putting you in here to see if we can fix it. And you're 32 years old. I'm 30, actually. You're 30 years old yeah. and hungry and eager. And what did you think you had that Vanity Fair needed? Well, it's interesting. You know, when you're young, you have this kind of bravado and you have this instinct and you uh, have a kind of, I did anyway, a sort of conviction that I was the one who, who was destined to do this uh, this job, um, but I didn't. But I didn't really know how to get it done. I just was following a kind of a blind instinct at first. But I, you know, I I, I, came, I, I, I parachuted in. And the great thing about a deadline is that it helps you get over your lack of confidence. I mean, I've always felt for myself that, co that deadlines were my confidence uh, sort of booster because then I couldn't sit there. Because actually, I get very neurotic about deadlines and what I'm going to write and so on. But if the deadline is there, you just have to get it done. Yes. I've never missed a deadline. It just, it just gets me to kick in, you know? So we had to put out an issue. And um, so the first thing I had to do was just to come in and tear up everything that was there and put out my first issue of Vanity Fair. And I got so focused on what that issue was going to be, which for me was going to be this great mix. I saw it all, all as this amazing uh, buffet of, 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 of material that would work off each other. I always had that sense of what a magazine should be. And I immediately got started on uh, redesigning it from top to toe. Which is, we often talk about that as sort of high-low culture or... Do you see it that way? I do, very much. I mean, the problem with Vanity Fair when I took it over was that they started by having these very kind of pretentious abstract drawings on the covers. Then they went to these pictures of by Irving Penn in black and white of intellectuals looking very <laughs> serious. And one of them was Philip Roth with his finger up his nose, you know. I mean, it was just really glum. And I felt Vanity Fair speaks about glamour and, and society and, and a sense of sparkle. You know, we have to have famous, beautiful peop women and men on this cover. So I went straight into thinking we needed to do celebrity covers. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, I was able to ransack the drawers of the art department and start finding some of the things that they weren't using by Annie Leibovitz. Well, you write when you got to Vanity Fair that you joined the Boys Club. You also write that most of my role models have been men. They have always had the lives I wanted to live. 
as a woman and a mother, have you gotten to live a man's life? <laughs> well, at the time, you know, there just weren't many women I could point to who was doing what I wanted to do. That was the real thing. I mean, I wanted to be uh, a big-time editor of a, uh, a, a big-time magazine or newspaper. And as I looked around, I, di I didn't really see any women. I mean... The, 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 the people I admired at the time were, you know, were Clay Felker, the great magazine editor of New York Magazine, R R Jan Wenner, editor of Rolling Stone. Um, mm. I did have a lot of heroes uh, sort of uh, who had come earlier. I mean, Carmel Snow, the great editor of Bazaar uh, in the 30s, was a, was a big hero of mine, actually. She was extraordinary, and Diana Vreeland in her own way. But, of course, I, I wasn't a fashion editor, but I did admire her her uh, ability to, to, to her, her tremendous conviction that she had about everything she did. You have some great one-liners in here, um, away with words, I should say. Boris Johnson, an epic shit. This was in the 1980s. <laughs> this one made me laugh out loud. Walter Mondale would make an excellent prime minister of Norway. <laughs> Oh, so many judgments dispatched. For you. No, no, there's more. There's more. And then a whole series of you commenting on people's faces, which I found fascinating. Watching Jackie, I don't know if she was Onassis or Kennedy yeah, at Onassis. the time, but watching Jackie close up was mesmerizing. Her face was always slight, uh, slightly out of whack with her expression. Rupert Murdoch's face is degenerated to the melting rubber mask of a cartoon characters like Nixon. Jerry Zipkin's face up close is like a huge inflatable rummer dinghy balanced on top of a short Humpty Dumpty body. <laughs> Philip Roth, intriguing in pictures and on page, but in reality he's like an accountant, although granted his mean sparkling eyes suggest something more interesting. Is there something of a mean girl in you? <laughs> Well, now you read those out, I feel <laughs> slightly... I enjoyed them, well, I have to the say. the whole point is I didn't drink, okay? So I was at these parties, and I could keep beadily observing, I suppose. And, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I, loved, I loved that, actually. I mean, I did have what I call observation greed. You know, I loved, I loved going out and meeting these people and feeling it was my job, in a sense, to record what I'd seen. And right. ever since I was a child, I found writing a diary a very sort of therapeutic, cathartic way of understanding my own life and sort of understanding what I thought about people too. Sometimes uh, just being up close and being able to kind of drill down and think, who are these people, mm. was a very uh, kind of privately interesting thing that I was doing. And, um, you know, of course, reading it now, I, I'm startled at some of these <laughs> judgments. I mean, I, I made a decision not to censor the diary. You know, I decided... Um, perhaps recklessly, but it seemed that if you're going to do a diary, it's got to have that candid, right. dashed out, you know, sometimes the, the, the judgments are, are things that I would, I would soften later, you know, I might think differently, but at the time, that's how it seemed, and I wanted to record it that way. One more, Carl Icahn, a great giant of a man with a big, humorless nose, very close together eyes, and foghorn voice. <laughs> Just to add. Yes, one of the things that is a bit of a refrain in the book is how big men are always coming up to me and stabbing me in the chest with their huge fingers and saying, you know, <laughs> you, you'll never turn this thing around, you know. Or it's like, this magazine is in the toilet, you know. <laughs> you won't get this off the ground. And it, was, it got me increasingly sort of mutinous because I felt there were all of these big guys who were always telling me I couldn't make it work. Yeah. You spent, I mean, frankly, I was exhausted reading all the parties you went to, the luncheons, the soirees that seem to go on forever, and it's probably good that you don't drink. But at the same time, I got the feeling <laughs> Definitely. that you have or had a kind of ambivalent, not, I don't know if it was love-hate relationship with celebrities, but you were both attracted and somehow repulsed. Yeah, I was. I mean, at one point I say, you know, why am I keep doing these things that I don't want to be doing, you know, yes. most of the time? Well, it, you know, I've always felt that an editor's job was to be in the, in the mix, in the swirl, and to be able to see the stories that are going on. And Vanity Fair was a magazine, is a magazine, really, that identifies uh, the sort of the, 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 the cutting edge of culture at that time. And the fact is that at that moment, um, the Reagan years were this, this as, as Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, America threw itself a huge party, borrowed, and borrowed you know three trillion dollars to do it, and it's true. It was a big, huge black tie era that has vanished. And one of the things that I don't miss at all are those dinner parties. In fact, my father, my husband's great motto is the best dinner party is the one that's cancelled. Yes. Yeah. And did he <laughs> did he get dragged to just about all of these things? Yes. Well, I did go to a lot of things. In fact, it blows my mind how many I went to. Actually, I was you know it was the 
I don't even have, I think I've got one long dress now. In those days it was like black tie, long dresses, red nails, the whole big swirl. But um, I was always looking for material and it's where I got a great many of my leads. And sometimes, very surprisingly so, in fact my advice to, to editors and writers was always you should go out, even at you know, talks and, and panels and, and, and you need to go out. To, to, to not be locked in your rooms. In those days, it wasn't screens, but it was today. People very rarely leave their screens. Yeah. And I always got great material when I went out. In fact, one evening, I went to a fundraiser for uh, suicide survivors with Anna Winter, because uh, her husband worked in that area as a psychiatrist. And uh, uh, one of the people who stood up and talked about their, uh, uh, their experience with suicide uh, attempts was uh, the great writer William Styron. You oh, know? Sure. And he talked about how he suffered keenly from depression. And I went and asked him if he would write about that for Vanity Fair, and he thought about it, and he said he would like to do that. And that became a very influential and brilliant piece, uh, called, uh, which I called, actually, A Darkness Visible, which is a line mm -hmm. in a poem by, by Milton. And he wrote this piece. It was incredible. It was made a tremendous waves. It, it, it really helped a lot of people, because you know, very few high-profile people had spoken about suffering from depression as he did in that article. He then turned it into a book, which became a bestseller. And, you know, I like to think, well, that all came because I went to this fundraiser. <laughs> and that's what editors right. need to do. They have to go out. You are also, you also describe yourself as an introvert. So did you have to drag yourself there or, yeah, or I never wanted, yourself up? I never very really wanted to go, but I was always pleased that I did. And then the other side of the diaries, obviously, is, is that introvert that, that, that I was, you know, the, the other side. And, uh, uh, and of course, you know, the, the, the dual life I led then of having these two children, um, uh, which were the other great passion in my life sort of pulling me in the other mm -hmm. direction. So like most women, I think I was constantly negotiating with myself about, am I a good enough mother? Am I spending too much time at work? The sort of the agony of always feeling, you know, was I in the right, doing the right thing as a mother? And I don't think that ever leaves you really when you, no. There's when no you're working. There's no correct answer, I think. And there is no that. correct answer, exactly right. Let me ask you a couple of things, and uh, I guess every, question, every conversation inevitably, inevitably leads to Donald Trump. Um, but he, um, you describe him, and this is of course the 1980s, uh, the sneaky, petulant infant. Everyone knows he's going broke. This was the 1980s. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, look, he does sort of recur like a kind of virus, as it were, <laughs> in, in the book. I mean, he's, he's constantly popping up, you know, with his... Um, and I like him a lot at the first time I meet him, actually. I, I do like him at the first... I, I extracted the art of the deal. Um, and I, I say in the, in the book that I'm sent this manuscript and I read it one weekend and I say, this is authentic bullshit, you know, but, but it's, it's authentic bullshit. I think the public will like nothing more. Yeah. Um, because there was a freshness to his voice at that time. And uh, he was funny. You know, I, I, I would go to dinner parties and, and there he would be and, and he would always be bouncing it back and forth in this, in this very kind of brash, hey, Tina, I'm on the cover of Newsweek, you know. And, uh, you know, it's better than time, isn't it? You know? <laughs> well, and even better, you're kind of needling him, saying, uh, you Yeah, know. and I say, oh, well, actually, no, it's not as good as time. Well, I could have had time. I could have had time. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and, and you know, the, I went to the opera last night, you know, three hours, no interval. I said to Ivana, what? Are you crazy? You know, Pavarotti, so what? You know, uh, and I thought, I like this. This is great. Particularly yeah. as there was this Italian decorator sitting there going, oh, Mr. Trump, he's such a terrible, vulgar person. You know? <laughs> so those were your parties? That was it. Yes, that was it. That was one of the better ones. I came back and I said, I said to Harry, this, this Trump, you know, I, I, I like this decorator. You know, I was like on his side. It was very funny. Well, you did have a Vanity, Vanity Fair piece, I guess, about his divorce, um, where the writer yeah, found he didn't, he that did, he, he didn't like that, and he wound up emptying wine down the writer's back. So, but that, that he apparently had Hitler's yes, speeches. Yes, she said a, that she broke the news that he had Hitler's speeches on his desk, which was pretty interesting at that point. There's also something else, actually, which is that in the we used to have the Hall of Fame portfolio where we would photograph people and do these kind of little captions about why they deserve to be there. And on the Trump uh, nomination, it said, because, because he thinks he should be renegotiating arms control with the Russians. It's interesting. Goodness gracious. I know, I was struck when I saw that. I thought, you know, obviously, he was already beginning to kind of put out this kind of presidential vibes to, to himself, even if nobody else noticed. But he was. 
Well, we are in this, for lack of a better word, Me Too moment, and every day, you know, we're hearing about, who was it, Matt Lauer yesterday, Garrison Keillor yesterday, losing their jobs over accusations of, if not sexual assault, harassment, or some version of that. How do you understand, though, the president's Teflon ability when it comes to this issue? It wasn't his voice on the tape. <laughs> well, that, I would, exactly. I mean, the tape for which he apologized. That was just fake news. I mean, right. But, but you how, know that. Well, we're how working could we on be, it. How could we be so foolish to think that it's him? But is that, is that the answer? It's stunning, isn't it? Um, I think that one is not going to stick on him. I just don't. I think that, uh, it's interesting, actually, shortly after that, the election. You know, I was in Texas and I, then two days later and I was asking many of the women who were uh, working at our Women in the World event that we put on um, and they'd all voted for Trump, you know, and I, I, I asked them why after the tape because I thought that would, I said, didn't that matter? And they all said, no, nope, not really. It was like, you know, like it's more important to me that like we get the economy right, you know. Right. And I, and I think that the only danger of the, of the, of the sort of uh, this current moment is that we'll end up again sort of alienating uh, a lot of regular women. Because I think about, you know, hotel maids and, and, and casino workers and, and people in, in uh, fast food and so on who, who, who have no leverage at all for how uh, to protest when they're treated. And I wonder whether they will feel they just don't have the means or, or the celebrity to to fight back, and does that make them glad that that's happening in, in the culture generally, or does it make them feel right. this is just another set of privileges that they don't have? Or whether this is just a moment and then we will move on, thinking, yes. of course, of Anita Hill. And Indeed, other and I think the emphasis needs to be on the women who are powerless. I really do. Right. Um, and last year, actually, at Women in the World, we did this very discussion, and we were made, you know, we had a, a, a woman who was a farmer, on, a farm woman on the stage, because I wanted to make sure that who had been horribly sexually harassed the whole time she was uh, uh, in, on the fire service. And I thought it's very important to hear those stories, actually, right. much more important right. Uh, right now than hearing, uh, uh, I mean, you know, what we've heard is, is horrendous. I mean, I'm not suggesting any way we shouldn't be hearing the stories, but I do want to hear from those women who are not, uh, who don't have the leverage right. that some of these more prominent women do. Does it, though, tell us something about this celebrity culture? And, and certainly Vanity Fair was a big part, and it continues to be a big part of the celebrity culture where people with power and money have publicists who tell them that they're beautiful and smart and they get the best seat at the restaurant and somehow come to believe that the rules do not apply to them. Well, this is what we're seeing, isn't it? Away. It's pretty stunning. I mean, every single time I'm stunned, actually, when I read the details, I have to say, every time. Uh, uh, because it does seem to be a kind of, I'm in this universe where I can do exactly what I want. And... I mean, I did see some of that, and in, in my diary, you know, we, I have many exchanges with sort of men of power and celebrity in Hollywood and so on, and I make fun of their absolute, uh, like Peter Guber, who is the head of Columbia, oh. he sits down at the uh, table with me, he's never met me before, and we're having, he wanted to have breakfast with me, running at that point Columbia Pictures, and he says, he sits down, he's got a ponytail, and you know, he's the classic Hollywood producer, and he says, Hollywood Tina is run by its dick. I think... Oh, you know, would you like some toast and marmalade? I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I was taken aback. But, but, but to be honest, I mean, he was probably speaking the truth. Uh, 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 and we're seeing it now that actually he was simply telling me how it is. I well, felt the need to tell me how it is. I, I might, would have actually preferred him not to, but he did. So is that the way it stays, or is it, is it a matter of... Well, the great a, question now is... A is revolution a, of some sort? Well, I, I'd like to know whether or not this moment is actually going to provide the opportunities for women or not, you see. I mean, what we are seeing is a kind of patriarchal uh, wipeout, right, of these uh, very prominent men who, who have had it all, the lion's share of it to themselves. Mm -hmm. Personally, I think it's not that mysterious how to change it. I mean, there's a lot of thumb-sucking going on about how do we change the... The fact is, I mean, there were no women on the Weinstein board, right? So, for not one. one. There was ten men on the Weinstein board. And... I do really believe that, you know, it's not rocket scientist. It's science. If you have more women in the top management positions, you are not going to have these very toxic uh, patriarchal cultures, you know, developing. And unfortunately, what we see is women are always at that second level. The, 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 the networks, there's not one woman running, you know, a, yeah. a big network like 
all of, they're all occupied by men. Tons of women at the second level and the third level, but not actually in the top spots still. And that is why it doesn't change. Yeah. You wrote a piece, uh, this was back in October, I guess when they, we got news of, of Harvey Weinstein, the title, What Harvey and Trump Have in Common. But you talk about, in a sense, the, the two Harveys, the sort of bombastic, uh, predatory Harvey, who actually made you cry at some time mm. when you were working with him. But then the insecure, um, the insecure Harvey that is, you know, needs all these accolades. It's a, it, no, he's so insecure. I, I tended to feel that he was a person who had this kind of crazed, chaotic kind of dissonance in himself, you know, because he, he was a person who, who had enormous taste in, in, in films. I mean, right. English Patient and Shakespeare in Love and My Left Foot, wonderful films he made, which is why I went to work for him, obviously. And we mustn't forget, that's why a great many people did have a lot to do with him, because he did amazing work. But there was this other side of him, and, and he was like the kid who loved French films, but he also was a, personally a very, very gross and, and you know, uh, unattractive mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and sort of, you know, a kind of very bestial kind of man, really. And that was at war with his other side, and, he, and I think he had a lot of self-hatred about that, very likely. I mean... I could go on, but I, you know, he could probably doing all that work for himself in his Arizona rehab. But yeah, well, <laughs> we will see. And it's interesting to think about apologies. I mean, we've heard all these various apologies. You know, if I have harmed you, there's that one. There are many different kinds of apologies when people get caught or accused. Is there also a danger that everything gets all lumped together and then we don't make the distinction between pinching someone on the butt and being a predatory person who's much more well, assaulted someone that. on the butt is a bit predatory there. It is, it is but I'm just saying that yes, no, sort of I scheme mean, I, of things. I, I think obviously uh, gradation of, of outrage is very important otherwise we get outrage fatigue and it all gets completely lumped in as you said and I think that's very unfortunate um, that there is a gradation between sort of clueless uh, uh, you know gauche somewhat gross guys mm -hmm. and and a, a, you know, an assaulter and a rapist and an abuser of power. I think it's very important to, to remember that the real key about sexual harassment is abuse of power. Right. You know, are you making somebody who doesn't have power feel threatened and unsafe because you have, uh, uh, you're emanating these, these feelings of being, uh, she has uh, to, to tra have a transaction with you because of that. And I think it's very important we don't muddle it up into being, someone who is simply, uh, you know, a, a very gauche, uh, a clueless man. And I think that we are going to see some casualties, obviously, some corollary damage to that. But unfortunately, I think it sort of has to happen to make the revolution happen. You yeah. know, I think that this, yeah. this is a huge accountability moment. There will be people who get swept up in it, unfortunately. Let me shift gears. This is a weird kind of a segue, but you mentioned your children. Mm -hmm. um, your first son, Frederick, was born. Georgie. Georgie. Ge well, George Frederick. Was George that George Frederick, Frederick Handel? Yeah. Or, or some yeah, George Frederick, yes. George Frederick. Um, he was born premature. Mm -hmm. And in your diary, you, you question whether you worked too hard, you didn't take enough care of yourself, and felt some degree of, yeah. of guilt about it. Yeah, that. I did. I felt very guilty about it. Um, he was two months premature, and he had as he has Asperger's, and for a long time we didn't know what Asperger's was because it didn't really have a label then. But I did realize gradually that I wasn't sure whether it was because he was premature that he had uh, delays and that he had uh, he wasn't doing the, the the things that kids are supposed to do at the right moments that they're supposed to do them. But at the same time, he was this delicious and sweet and funny, and you know, and there were he had so many wonderful. Um, things about him, but I did realize that there were things that weren't, weren't right. And that's a big sort of poignant theme, really, I think, in the, in, in the book, is, is, is wondering what is happening and why, and feeling, is it my fault? Which I think so many mothers do feel when they have a, a kid who has issues. But he, he does, uh, eventually, uh, I discovered that he has Asperger's, and I learned it, actually, because of a piece I wrote in the, uh, I ran in the New Yorker uh, when Georgie was about nine, after Vanity Fair, when uh, Oliver Sacks wrote his wonderful piece yeah. about Temple Grandisman, the, uh, the Asperger's woman. Brilliant and piece. as I read the piece about Temple Grandisman, I thought, oh my God, you know, so many of her characteristics are like Georgie. And I picked up the phone to Oliver. I said, Oliver, I think my child might have Asperger's. And he actually gave me the name of someone to consult. And indeed, uh, that diagnosis was, was confirmed. But I mean, he's now doing, I have to say, wonderfully. He's now 30. 
He lives in his own apartment, drives a car, work, works in a, a small NGO, and he still says wonderful Asperger's things. Like at my book party, when Anna Winter came in, he said, hello, are you, are you Camilla Parker Bowles? <laughs> He said, or some other person from the 80s. So, <laughs> I don't know. You know. He's kind of like you, don't you think? <laughs> well, the, the great joy of Asperger's is, you know, they, the, an Asperger's person just cannot tell a lie. They just say whatever's in their mind. Right. And you realize just how lies make the world go round. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. And, and what does your daughter do? My daughter is a little news hound. She uh, graduated from Harvard, and she works at Vice Media as wow. a, as a uh, producer who is constantly now texting me saying, Matt Lauer, how do I, what do we do, you know? <laughs> so, Such um, a good question, yes, isn't it? Yes, exactly. So uh, she's, she's wonderful. I mean, she's enormous fun. And, uh, but, you know, her media world is, she loved reading the diaries because she found it so fascinating to, to, to see a world where media was such a kind of confident, big, sort of, uh, sort of a focused profession in a way. You know, I mean, today media is all about sort of grabbing on to, to bits and pieces all around. And she's, she's loving what she does because, you know, she hasn't known the other kind of media. But uh, I think that there is a hunger for, for quality amongst the young. You know, she, she feels envious that we were able to kind of do a 12,000-word piece by William Styron and yeah. see it from beginning to end and, and see it done instead of always feeling we don't have the ability to do this, we can't pay for this, we can't all of the things that one feels in today's media environment. You say, and it's so clear that you love magazines, do you worry about the future of magazines? And even if you go to a magazine rack, I don't even know if they exist anymore, you know, what do you see there? Well, I do think it's uh, a very imperiled uh, thing, a magazine. And, you know, I mean, I have to say I don't buy magazines like I did. You know, I, mm -hmm. I um, subscribe to two or three, the old ones that I, I edited and a couple more. Uh, so I think that the magazines are obviously shrinking and shrinking. I don't care as much about that as I care about being able to sustain brilliant work. I don't really care in the end how people get it, although I definitely think magazines are an art form that I'd love to see continue. Um, because they are working with words and pictures and headlines and, and, and the book really is something of a love affair for a profession, actually, of a excitement of a, of, of a profession that I love, and in every detail. I mean, I, there are so many scenes of me like writing captions and headlines, and endlessly worrying about the contents page, and all of these things, which are just the details that make something shine. You know, so I, I, I miss I, I miss that. But I also do think that one can do a lot of exciting stuff digitally. And, and sure. when I started the Daily Beast, I found it very very exciting to. Uh, to move into that realm, actually. And I'm thinking of all these Annie Leibovitz photographs that were so central to Vanity Fair. Yes, what was so it like Annie, to work with her? Annie's a, Annie is just a genius. I mean, I love her to death. She is the hardest working person in the universe. I mean, that's why she's so amazing. I mean, she obsesses about these photographs. I mean, she has a vision of what she wants, and then she's determined to get it, and the vision grows, and she knows that she wants a certain kind of picture. So if she doesn't get it on the first shoot, she is then determined to go get another shoot. And that is very hard, very often, to pull off, because people don't want to do it again. But she wheedles, and she hmm. makes people feel it's important, and she has such command of the set, really. You know, she's like a John Houston on the set of a film. You know, when you come on to Annie's set, you know, with her blaring music and a wind machine and she's very big and tall with a big laugh and you know she kind of owns the room right. and uh, she just in the end creates such a confident sense that she's in charge that people very often do let her go back one more time and uh, on the third time she goes back then they take their shirt off you know? <laughs> <laughs> she's very good at that <laughs> You have some great stories about growing up um, in England, obviously, and your parents, who seemed extraordinarily permissive. You got kicked out of a whole bunch of schools, and uh, describing your father basically backing you up, saying it's your loss to the headmaster, yes. headmistress, and then moving on from there. Yeah, my, my parents, my mo fa father was a movie producer, and I mean, I think that they basically agreed that the schools I, were at, I was at were mostly kind of these preposterous uh, Upper class boarding schools that they thought i mean really they they knew they were they were ridiculous schools i mean they were really, but somehow that was where one was going and um, so I was always 
being kicked out for, for crimes of attitude, actually. I mean, I was just very insubordinate <laughs> and very annoying. I mean, it wasn't anything serious. It wasn't anything like drugs or alcohol or anything like that, but I was just very rebellious. And on one occasion, I was kicked out because I led a demonstration. Uh, the school insisted that you had to wear two pairs of underwear. Uh, <laughs> and why was that? I was curious. Because it was one of these, you know, boarding schools for St. Trinian's kind of boarding schools. And I had so you had to have this big pair of gray outer knickers that you had to wear. And I just didn't want to have to wear these big gray outer knickers. I just didn't like them. And they were huge and they were hot. <laughs> so I led this demonstration across the, um, the cross pitch, which said knickers out, out, out. <laughs> knickers in, in, in. Anyway, it was me that was out, not the knickers, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, they just, that was it. They said she's out. And uh, my father came again with my mother in the car. My father says, my mother says, Christina, pack up your trunk. You know, we're going to be leaving. And my father says to the head teacher, how sad it must be to have failed with this remarkable girl. <laughs> Come along, you know, then we swept out. I mean, of course, when I got home, I then got some a bit of hell. But, well, I was but, wondering but, about that. But, but at the same time, you know, once with the school, there was total solidarity with me, which is, I will always be glad of. Are you that way with your children, or have you been moments of that? I think I probably am like that. Um, I mean, you know, I, 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 my daughter did get a bit mouthy in her last year at, at school, but, um, you know, sh I'm basically on their side, yes. You describe your parents' marriage as, as looking like Ronald and Nancy Reagan, that they were just very connected. They were. They had the most amazing marriage, actually. They... There was this marvelous complicity between them. They, they, my mother was, uh, uh, she was very diva-like. She was a very beautiful woman, actually. And she, she was Laurence Olivier's assistant. And then she met my father at um, Pinewood Studios. And, uh, and they had this marvelous love affair for, you know. And, 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 it, and it really was something that I even felt excluded us a bit, you know, because you'd come back and there they were together laughing, talking. You could hear that laugh from the outside as they were having their evening drink, which they always did. But um, it was a very close family. You know, my brother also uh, went into movies. And um, in the diaries, there's a lot, of, a lot of thinking about my parents because I had to leave them, obviously, when I came to New York. And then my father kind of fell on, on difficult times because his movies kind of dried up and they went off to live in Spain. And I was very troubled by, by that and a sense of responsibility for them. And one of the impetuses for me in trying to get a decent amount of money and be paid was I really did want to support my parents, put my father, put any anxieties out of his mind. Mm. And eventually I was able to persuade them to come and live with us in New York, which is how I was able to, to do the job of the New Yorker because without my mum there, I think I would have found it very difficult to, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to leave my kids as much as I had to for the New Yorker. You seem to love your husband very much. Mm -hmm. My husband, I'm very lucky. I married uh, Harry Evans, who is, uh, uh, he was a very important journalist in London. He was really the kind of the Ben Bradley of London, edited the London Sunday Times. A uh, fantastic journalist, crusading journalist, had amazing investigations that he, he, uh, he broke the story that Kim Philby was a spy. You know, he broke the story of the thalidomide uh, when the kids were, were being uh, born deformed because of thalidomide. It was a campaign he fought and won to get compensation for them. So he was the sort of, he always referred to as the James Bond of journalism, which Ooh. I teased him about a lot. And um, he's 25 years older than me, but um, we fell madly in love when I was, you know, just out of Oxford, really, and uh, working, writing for the Sunday Times, and we met because of that. Right. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's just been my mentor, my, my guide, my support, and he's just, I'm remarkably lucky, and I think... Um, when I came to New York to do Vanity Fair, I mean, he urged me to come. He didn't say, well, what am I going to do? You know, which most, a lot of husbands would have right. said. He said, look, you take it, you do it, I'll figure something out. And he did. He went off and taught at Duke, and then eventually he, he ended up running Random House for, for Cy Newhouse, which was wonderful. But uh, so he, he's, he's just always encouraged me to take that leap. And uh, so I can't pretend that I've been this big daredevil, you know, who did it without support, because I didn't. And, and that theme is all the way through the book. And there are nice moments, I think, when that becomes evident when, for instance, we see our dream house yeah. uh, at, at the beach in Long Island and uh, we're looking for a house to rent and um, we see this house, this old 1928 uh, uh, lovely uh, gave, uh, uh, house, shingled house on the beach at Quag in Long Island and 
that's when we feel sort of, I feel our whole romantic bond is really sealed when we have this house together. And uh, we stayed with that house for 30 years. You still, you still don't have that house because it sounds sold lovely. It, uh, it's so wonderful. We sold it two years ago after Hurricane Sandy when it, it needed a whole rebuild. And when I did, I didn't feel it had the same feel anymore. You wrote this back in 1989. Here I live in a permanent red-hot present, fascinated, appalled, thrilled, amused, enraged, but never ultimately touched because in the end, I'm always a spectator and a foreigner. Do you feel that way now? You live in New York. Um, less than I did then. Um, it took me quite a about five, at least seven or eight years to really be fully uh, not an expatriate anymore. I, I kind of gradually transitioned into being an American. And actually, it wasn't until 2000 and, uh, 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 2001 that I, I, I became uh, a, a, an American citizen. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Was there something that... Yeah, 9-11. 9-11. 9-11 did it for sense. me. 9-11 made me realize that I love New York passionately, and I was an American, that huh. I felt so emotionally connected to America at that time, that I felt that I wanted now to be an American citizen. But all the way through the diaries, you read the sort of push and pull of, of, of England, you know, because I was very, right. very, and I still feel, very emotionally connected to England, and I long for the manageability of London. I talk about how hard America is. I say America needs editing, is one of the things <laughs> I think. In one of my more sort of cranky moments, because I feel London had that smaller scale. I love the historic atmosphere. I like the, you know, I like knowing the history. I like all of the things which I found very hard when I first came here. Yeah. You wrote a book about Diana, so I have to ask you about Prince Harry and his engagement to Meghan Markle, who is an American. She's divorced. She's biracial. Um, how do you think this is going to go with the with the, I guess, the tradition of the royal family. I think it's amazing and fantastic. I think it's a huge leap forward, uh, both for the royal family and for England, actually. It's a wonderful thing, particularly at this moment when Trump is making everybody crazy, sort of tweeting about Muslims and all the rest. It's like people love the fact that open-hearted sort of Prince Harry has yeah. found, fallen in love with a beautiful biracial girl who's very independent and smart. And, you know, she's 30 five, which is 36, I think she is, which is the same age of when Diana died. Oh, so she's, she's the same age now when he's married. You know, so she is a fully formed adult woman. And that's a very, very good thing. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, the, 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 the poignant thing, I think, because I knew Diana you know, well, and I've studied her for such a long time, is just how uh, she, this was all about who she was. I mean, Diana opened up England in a way. You know, she was the first inclusive mm -hmm. Uh, presence in the royal family, and uh, her funeral, that, that huge, uh, you know, a display of grief that the country showed. I remember when I arrived in England to cover that uh, for the NBC Today show, uh, thinking the quality of the crowd in the streets was utterly different from anything I'd ever seen in England. It was a mixed race crowd, it was a crowd of gay couples, it was a crowd of, you know, uh, biracial marriages. It was, it was such a wonderful picture of a new kind of England that had been sort of buried in the shires, as it were, and people hadn't really noticed what had happened, and this was what had happened, which was she understood. So she began it, and she paved the way for Harry to do this. So she'd be very happy from I think what you be, know yes, about her. Yes, I think her. she'd be thrilled. What was she like? I mean, you wrote a whole book about it, and, and in your diary, you, you describe her as a very young 24-year-old, and I think Charles is a very old 36-year-old, yeah. or some version of that. Well, she was, when I first met her at the age of uh, 19, when she was just engaged to Charles, when I was still editing Tatler, uh, she was this, like this amazing English rose and so shy and so sort of young. And I mean, 19 is very, very young. And that's yes. what we didn't really think. Think about it. She married Charles when she was 20. Yeah. I mean, it seems really almost cruel. It was cruel because she was the only person who didn't realize it was an arranged marriage. They all knew, but she didn't know. Unfortunately, she wasn't let in on the, on the secret until she understood about Camilla Parker Bowles' right. sinister presence, you know, in the, in the background. But uh, so she was so, she was go almost gauche. She was so awkward, you know, but she had this incredible skin uh, that was like velvet. I mean, just this velvet skin, these huge eyes. I mean, like big blue pools of feeling, you know. And There's that face again that yeah, you notice. incredible right? face. And... Uh, you know, she was obviously quite extraordinary. But then when I, the last time I saw her was six weeks before she died in New York when she came to sell her dresses at Christie's. Oh. 
uh, for a charity. And she asked me for lunch uh, with Anna Winter at the Four Seasons. And it was so startling to see her then walk through the Four Seasons with every head turning. And now she's this diva, this, this, you know, this celebrity, the biggest, most famous woman in the world by that time. And so poised and so confident and so absolutely different, really, from that child that I had met. Yeah. But she was still very, very vulnerable. And um, she talked at that lunch about her loneliness and uh, how the summer was coming up and she dreaded uh, being alone uh, uh, because her boys were going to be at Balmoral with Charles. And she said to me, you know, I'm, people think that I'm, I'm going to have a wonderful summer, you know, off with various friends. But she said, it's very hard having me to stay. I can't, I can't really, I, I cause so much press and, you know, people don't want me to stay. And of course, when I heard that she died, I thought about that a lot because she really went to stay with the al Fayeds out of uh, seeking safety. You know, she, they, they had the things that she thought that she could have that she needed, which was a, you know, cars and drivers and, and police protection and, right. you know, a boat where people wouldn't get at her and all of these things, which, of course, all turned upside down. And it was the very opposite of that holiday. But that's why she went. She thought that she was going to be protected. What do you miss about putting out a magazine? Oh, there's nothing more fun than putting out a magazine. I miss the whole collaboration with the talent and the team. I miss, I miss uh, standing there, you know, at the... Um, layout desk and, and, and with, the, with the pictures and the, and the text and having us all, all working for the same goal. We've got to get this done, got to get it out, putting it on the wall, looking at it, or on the computer as I did at talk, just making, we, we used to create a dummy book with the whole magazine in mm. it because you still needed to see it physically. And then we'd page through it and see how the mix of things went. The funny thing about a magazine is that the mix can sometimes surprise you. I mean, in your mind, you've got these articles and you've got these pictures, and then you look at it together. Actually, it doesn't really work as a, as a package at all. And people seem to wrongly think that a great magazine is a lot of articles that are good. That's actually not what a magazine is. You can have 10 articles that are brilliant and not have a good magazine. Mm. It's about how the articles play off each other and the, 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 the difference in texture between them and the visual... Uh, sort of sweet and sour, high, low, all of it makes an energy that is quite different from simply a bunch of articles. In fact, there was one edition that we had which I had to turn upside down because I discovered that everybody in the photographs had a bald head. <laughs> and, I mean, I didn't sort of notice that in, in the, when the writing was there, but, I mean, it, it, Bruce Willis had a bald head and, and so did Harold Brodsky and, 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 and so did Winston Churchill who had, there was a big extract about him and it was like, bald heads! <laughs> So we had to sort of just tear it up. <laughs> so what was it like to work for you, Tina Brown? Well, in that instance, I think it was very irritating, actually. It was like, what the hell is this going to do with the right. fact I just edited a huge piece about Winston Churchill, and you're saying to me, he's got a bald head. Right. Yeah. That's the way it was. Sorry. So that's what it was like. <laughs> Hi. I'm actually here with my girlfriends. We have a Vanity Fair club we meet every month and talk oh. about the magazine. So thank you for laying the foundation of the magazine we love so much. And I'm wondering your thoughts on um, the post Graydon Carter era as he moves on next year and what your hopes are for the magazine, what will change or maybe stay the same? Well, I think Radhika Jones is a very good choice to be the editor. I think she's uh, modern and, and young and, and she's got a great literary background and she's a real magazine maker. You know, she's worked at Time Inc. And, and she was also very well regarded there as somebody who had great feature ideas. So I think she's got everything that you need to be a really good editor. I think the, it's great that we have a woman coming in after 25 years again because, you know, the voices of women have been somewhat missing from the magazine in terms of narratives through the eyes and voices of women. And you know, now that I do that at Women in the World Summit so much, I realize how few of these narratives by women there are out there, actually, that, you know, I want to hear about the world of women through women's voices. And you're seeing at the moment there's so many women wanting, just obviously just dying to talk about what's been happening to them, really. It's a kind of explosion of voices. So this is a real opportunity, I think, for Radhika Jones to liberate some of those voices. Do you still keep a diary? So, yes, sometimes, but not, not in the way that I did. There's something very intimate about the, the pen and the page. Oh, the actual and pen and the page? And I now write on a computer, yeah. and I was just thinking the other night I'd quite like to write something, and, but getting my laptop out of my sort of overhead bag, and I, by the time I thought about doing that, I couldn't be bothered. So I, <laughs> I think that uh, I've got to go back to the uh, 
to the old school books. Yeah, they still exist, right? And, and is that what it was, school books? The, it was. It was those, lined, books? those blue lined exercise books, yeah. you know? And how old or how young were you when you started to keep it? I diary? was about 10. Wow. But I was at one of those terrible boarding schools. Oh, you were? <laughs> <laughs> and would you, was, were you as interested in celebrity? No, or? it was all about the teachers and how s foolish they all were. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was all about that. You mentioned Tatler. For people that maybe haven't followed your career, tell us about your time there. Well, my, that was my first job. Uh, Tatler was uh, a very well-pedigreed magazine that was founded in the 18th century, actually, by um, with a, a, a group of writers that included Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's oh. Travel. So it had a kind of pedigreed 18th century past. And it was a kind of a coffee house a pamphlet, really, of that period. And then uh, it gradually became uh, a sort of society magazine. It became the kind of Downton Abbey weekly uh, <sighs> photographs of the rich and famous, well, the, or really the aristocracy, not the rich and famous, it was the aristocracy partying at their various stately homes. And then it kind of went into this real slough of despond. It really died. It was a kind of ailing, glossy mag magazine with a few society pictures in it. And it was bought in 1983 by a real estate man from Australia who wanted to get into publishing. And uh, he decided he wanted to make it into a real glossy magazine like Harper's and Queen or Vogue. And he looked around for an editor and everybody turned him down. <laughs> and I was 25 and I'd been writing, since I got out of Oxford, various quite sort of amusing pieces around the place. And somebody said to him, you know, you're not gonna get an editor who's experienced, why don't you just go for youth and you should, why don't you talk to, to this woman, me? And I, I immediately wanted to do it. I, I, it was very uh, bold of him to give it to me, really, but it was so small, you know. It yeah. was a bit like being given a blog today. It only had a 10,000 circulation. And I basically hired my friends. I had 12, a staff of 12. All of them did amazingly well. In fact, one of them became the chairman of the company eventually, and the other one came to America with me. Two of them came, actually, to America with me. Another one came with Anna Winter. So it was a very, very good young hmm. Turks kind of group that I found. And we put out a magazine that had a tremendous amount of attitude. And our, our, um, our motto was, if you don't have a budget, get yourself a point of view. <laughs> Which I very think is very, words, yeah. a very good thing. It was a 100,000 pound budget a year. So we, we were really kids playing. But it turned out yeah. to be a very successful, yeah. buzzy thing. Uh, could you say something about uh, the financial aspects of, your, of running a magazine? I mean, did it restrict you? Were you fully responsible for that as well? Uh, how does it interact? How did it work? With, your, with the other activities that yeah. you Yes. Well, the editors at Conley Nass were not responsible for uh, uh, the finances, but were very much involved with trying to get advertising. And so, from the beginning of, uh, of my career at Tatler and things, the question of how to get advertising was a huge question always. When I arrived at Vanity Fair, I mean, at Tatler, we turned it around and made it very successful in, its own, in a small way and sold it to Conley Nast. Um, at Vanity Fair, uh, when I came in, there was only 12 pages of advertising in, in, in Vanity Fair and 250,000 circulation. By the time I left, the magazine was 200 pages of advertising uh, and 1.2 million circulation. So we, we turned it around in about the third or fourth year. And, uh, but it was a huge slog to do so, and it lost a lot of money until then. You know, Cy, but it had lost about 50 million before I even took it over. And then it probably lost about another 30, I would say, in the first couple of years. But we turned it around and, uh, and made it into a juggernaut, actually. But uh, <clears throat> one of the themes in the book is trying to get advertising. I'm, I'm always slogging away, you know, with the publisher, going to see, you know, uh, Calvin Klein to try to persuade him to take ads or, or uh, uh, sitting there with this head of a Madison Avenue uh, you know, agency who, who's, who looks at my cover of Daryl Hannah blindfold and then... He looks at this portfolio we have inside of the great photographer Latigue, and he goes, "She's young. I like this old. Who are these people? They're dead, aren't they? Uh, I don't like." And then he did it again, like, "Young, yeah, hot, like, old, probably dead. Don't like." So I was like, "That's what it is." Like. That's yes, and it's your job to to it's make my the job pitch. to make him understand. It had to be both. Do you think you're a celebrity? No, I don't. I think, I, I think I'm a, I don't feel that. You I, don't feel that? I don't feel that, no. I feel mm -hmm. I've, I always felt a, that I'm a writer and a work, work person. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't feel 
that I am a celebrity? I mean, what is that? What, what's the difference? I'm not even sure anymore. Yeah. No. I can be if you'd like me to. <laughs> Would you comment on your relationship with Cy Newhouse and what will Condé Nast be without him? Mm. Yes. Well, I absolutely adored Cy Newhouse, but he's in the book. He's a very he's a mercurial presence. I mean, he has more entries almost than anybody. The book is a constant Cy watch, you know, in terms of his mood and so on, because he was a bit of a, a sort of a bit of like a Thurber character, because he was a reluctantly powerful man. He was short and shy and uh, uh, nebbishy and sort of, uh, but very shrewd and very impetuous in many ways, in a good way, because he would just say what he thought. And he was, although he was so shy and although he was so uh, uh, retiring in every way, he nonetheless was the Roman emperor of, of the company. It was his company, and everybody knew that he was the, really the only point of view that mattered. And so uh, dancing to size uh, quite erratic tune at times was difficult, because he, he had the habit of once he decided something, it changed instantly. And so he, when he used to come back from vacation, uh, he, he, from November to January, nothing would happen because it was Thanksgiving and you didn't want to do anything that would destabilize anything. And he would always go off to Vienna with his wife. Uh, he liked Vienna, he said, because people returned your call on the third ring. I thought so. <laughs> it was a typical side comment. And he would arrive back in January and then he'd fire everybody. And you know, he, would, he would fire publishers, he would close magazines, he would buy another magazine. It was just this incredible thing that used to happen in January. Everybody kind of sat there quaking for his return from holiday. And that's the way he was, it was like that. But at the same time, what was wonderful about him was he was the only person who, who mattered and therefore, but he made decisions and he, was very, he made them very quickly. And in fact, he, he, never, he returned calls faster than anyone I've ever met in my life. I mean, you'd phone him at, at nine and he used to get in at four in the morning and do all his work. Uh, which was a great policy because it meant the rest of the day was for everybody else. So mm -hmm. if you called him at nine, he called back at nine ten. What do you want? You know, I said, well, I want whatever I want. I was wondering about this, about more pages or whatever. And fine, no, yes, no, no, no time wasted. It was really wonderful to work for. And since then, I've seen how tedious corporations can be with all this kind of. You know, oh, I've got to socialize this decision and run it up the flagpole and talk to, <laughs> go, go to an off-site and talk to Jim and Jeff. And I mean, I, I could, I've never had to work like that. And I, and I couldn't work like that. I couldn't stand it. So Syed Koninas was a magical uh, leader in that regard. And I worked for him for 18 years, you know, so in various Tatler, Vanity Fair, and The New Yorker. And his, his memorial service actually was this past Monday, and I was very sad I couldn't go because I was in Toronto. Hmm. Um, but the company became very, very different in his last sort of 15, 20 years because it became much more corporate, obviously, as he got older. And the corporate sort of took over, in a sense. And it isn't like that anymore. It doesn't have that personal quality that it had when, when Cy was in charge. And uh, I think I was very lucky, actually, to work for Cy Newhouse. Very, very lucky indeed. It was a kind of a golden time. Did you have a strategy or methodology to help you deal with constant deadlines? Deadlines. You mentioned that you dealt with them very well. What was your secret? My secret is that I'm really a tremendous procrastinator, so that in, you know, without the deadline, I can't function. And in fact, I get quite depressed without deadlines. I kind of fall apart. I need, the you know, I need to be put onto the high wire and told to perform. And that's the only way I get over my self-doubt. Well, on that note of deadlines and self-doubt, Tina Brown, thank you so much. Thank you.